in those rooms were telling people to follow your dreams, try something new, and, and go where your heart is, because we certainly did that. SoulCycle is an extraordinary place. It's an exercise community. It's social and it's joyful and you feel like a rock star. It's therapy, it's escape, it's, it's fun. People come to us for the workout, but they stay for the breakthroughs they have on the bike. People get to change their lives, their bodies, their attitude. You lose yourself in the rhythm and you lose yourself in the pack and you work way harder than you ever would on your own. I love what I do because I get to be the best part of people's day. There are no words for me to really describe it. It is joy, it is love, it is community. You can have soulful moments, you can cry, you can laugh. It makes you feel better about yourself, it makes you feel better about your day, and it, it just works. You know, when I think about Soul Cycle, what I find on the bike, for me, it's love. How are you, Great Julie? Great to see you. Amazing. So I was thinking about this talk. We're so lucky to have Julie here. And, thinking, and I was talking to a, a charity who helps with all the content. It's like, Seth, what do you do when you sit down with someone for the first time when you're meeting them for an interview? And I say, we go straight to the childhood. So <laughs> that's what I, so I would very quickly, just to warm things up here, where'd you grow up? Tell us a little about your sure. life. I grew up outside of New York City in Westchester in a small town called Ardsley. My parents still live there. Um, and what else do you want to know about my childhood? Is there a story or a moment or something that you think would kind of sum up aspects of your childhood? That's a big question. Well, I had a pretty good childhood. Um, I have two super supportive parents. In fact, they're so supportive. I used to just, you know, if I brought home a B plus, they just thought it was the best B plus that they'd ever <laughs> seen. And I would literally walk home and I would say, doesn't anybody want to see me do better than that? You know? Um, but my parents were fantastic. And um, as a kid, I always loved musical theater. So I was super involved in the arts always, which was kind of different. Um, and I, I was always just like a really involved kid. I liked to be involved in everything, like, like whether it was student council or a team sport or a theater production, you know, collaboration and being part of things that were happening and people and communities has always sort of been my whole personality. Yeah, so um, I've, I've become fascinated with SoulCycle in the last two weeks. Um, yeah. Have you been? Amazing, amazing. Have you ever been? No, I haven't. Been. Okay. Uh, you're gonna, we're, we're, my you're wife right. is somewhere over there, and I'm like, we got to go to SoulCycle. Okay, I'm taking you wife, both. Yeah. We'll all go take a ride she, together. She, she goes. She goes. Um, the, uh, when, I mean, to do, it's like, it's, it's such a phenom. It's, 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 it's obviously so bigger than you. You created this thing. I always think about great leaders, great entrepreneurs can do something, can, can, can leave and it just gets even better. That's like, that's the essence of great leadership, building something great. When, when did you realize you had this sort of fire inside of you to, 
to do something like that? And did you, is that even a good question? Did you realize you had something? Like, when, where'd the motivation come from? So it's interesting. You know, I, I actually never really considered myself an entrepreneur, nor did I really think about starting my own business. The way that it happened was I had been living in Los Angeles. I was actually a talent agent in the movie business, and I represented actors. And I had started out doing that in New York, and then once I realized that if I wanted to be successful at it, I had to move to Los Angeles, I went and I lived in California for about nine years. And the thing that happened to me in LA was that I began to understand exercise as lifestyle. It became something more than just burning calories or you know, figuring out how to put something you know, on your to-do list, go to the grocery store, pick up your laundry. You know. um, and when I came back to New York, I ultimately moved back to New York for family. And I couldn't find anything like it here. It was just cut to you know, 2004, big box gyms, only memberships. There was actually no boutique fitness in the landscape at all. And I missed what I had in LA, which was really a community that revolved around exercise. It was social, it was communal, it was fun, you know, and it was exercise. And so I started to take classes at a bunch of different gyms looking for something, and there was really nothing to be found like that. And ultimately, what wound up leading me to start this business was I was creating a product for myself. You know, as I began to work on this business, I, I ultimately understood that the skill set that I developed in terms of creating brands around people and actors would come into play in a very big way. But the truth was, it really wasn't, I never woke up one day and said, oh my goodness, I want to start my own business. There was something missing, there was white space in the marketplace, it was a product that I needed. And what I always say to people who are thinking about being entrepreneurs is, it's one of those things, I mean, being an entrepreneur is so hard, you know, and starting your own company, and everyone tells you that you're crazy, and that it's a terrible idea. Um, Gary said it's very lonely and miserable, and you're likely to have a scarlet letter of sadness as you look for a new job. Yes, the, on the only thing is, I will say, the, the, the prevention, and I'm sure that we'll get into this at some point, is I had a fantastic business partner. Um, and that actually really saved me from a lot of loneliness. I mean, it had other issues, which we'll get, we'll get to in terms of learning to communicate with your colleagues. But um, that being said, uh, having a partner ma made it not so lonely. But what I will say about being an entrepreneur and taking a risk like that and starting a business is, you know, it really needs to be something that wakes you up in the middle of the night. For me, it wasn't, you know, about, oh, should I start a fitness business? Should I leave my job and start a business? It was one of those things where, I had to do this. I mean, I was waking up in the middle of the night and jotting little notes in a notebook by my bed. It could look like this, it could smell like this, the music could sound like that. And it just got to a point where it would not go away for me. And that, that's really what happened. You know, I don't know if I would have just started any business. It wasn't something where I said, oh, I want to be my own boss, I'm going to start a business. It was a specific thing that I was missing in the world. Amazing, amazing. Just show of hands, who's been to, uh, who's been to a Soul Cycle before? Besides me, not me. Amazing. You're going. So, tell, so we have people for, we have global audience, we have two rooms full of people. Um, very quickly, like the start, the start of SoulCycle, where it started, where it is today, and quickly just what, what is SoulCycle? Definitely. Um, so you, could, you, you got to see the video, which gives you a little bit of a feeling of what it's like to be at a SoulCycle class. And so on paper, you would say that SoulCycle is a 45 minute indoor cycling class set to great music and a really cool environment. Um, and that is kind of, you know, what you would, what you would say. And it's interesting to be talking to, group, to a group of marketers because in the beginning, you know, trying to figure out how to market something that was so experiential was so difficult for me because people would call and ask me to explain it. And, or, you know, I would, at the time we had, you know, no Instagram. People were just starting to use Facebook. And so it, it was really hard for me to articulate something that was an experience that you kind of needed to be in the middle of it. You know, I would call different publications to take you know, print ads, and then I would think, why would I ever do this? Nobody's gonna understand this from a print ad. Um, and that's something, something interesting about you know, something that marketing an experience. But you know, it was you know, 2006, there was no boutique fitness at all in New York City. So again, you had big box gyms where the model was, you know, get somebody to buy a membership, you take their credit card imprint, you know, mostly you hope that they don't show up. 
because if they don't show up, what you can do is you can also put two other members in you know, their, the spot that you would be counting for them. You can bump up your utilization rate. You can hope that everybody stays home. If nobody gets in shape, you can take more people into the gym. And that's kind of what existed. And, the, and gyms were pretty miserable. It was like drill sergeants, boot camps, you know, people yelling at you about calories and push harder and compete with the person next to you. And so it was, you know, not only was there no marketplace for this product, but there was certainly no product. And, you know, that was what was really interesting. As we opened our doors, it was really more about, and first, explaining to people why they would pay to come to something that was already included in a gym membership. But let's lens back even a little bit further now. So Elizabeth and I, um, my business partner Elizabeth and I were introduced at a lunch. We had both been taking classes with uh, an instructor at different gyms, and I had said to this instructor, I have an idea, it could be different, it could be better, and she had said to me, you know, there's a woman taking a class with me at another gym, and she'd like to, you know, start a fitness business, you guys should meet. We met, we had lunch, I, I say it was the best blind date I've ever been on, um, and four months later, we opened SoulCycle, which is crazy, because neither of us had a fitness background, neither of us had ever done anything like this. Uh, Elizabeth found a, um, an old dance studio listed on Craigslist. Uh, and that's what we went to see. It was 1,200 square feet. We paid $5,000 a month. When we saw the dance studio, we went across the street and we went to a Starbucks and we wrote on the back of a napkin that if we saw 100 riders a day at $27 a class, we would be able to pay our rent, pay the people that were helping us raise our children because we both had five-month-old babies at the time, and we'd have a little bit left over that we could put in a college fund or something to justify the, the, to justify the fact that we weren't actually going to raise our own children. And that is really, that's really what happened. Um, and that was kind of the beginning of SoulCycle and, and, and where it started. So today, you know, people always say to me, like, did you ever think, could you believe it was going to be, whatever, and you know what I always say, and this is what I really, again, I'm sure that you all think this every day when you're, you know, out there trying to, you know, market something or, or make something happen. You know, I never, ever thought, oh, there's going to be 95 SoulCycle Studios and we're going to be an international billion dollar company. That wasn't even in my mind, but what I did think every day was I'm getting 100 people here no matter what I have to do. If I have to walk up and down Broadway and hand out flyers and free passes, if I have to go to the Columbus Avenue Street Fair and set up a stand, if I have to chain a rickshaw to a parking meter, which is what we did, we had no sign on the door that said Soul Cycle because we were in the rear lobby of a building. So we bought a rickshaw on eBay and we painted it bright yellow and silver and it had a sign attached to it that said Soul Cycle this way. How's that for marketing? Um, <laughs> great idea, guys. Um, I actually got a ticket every day for chaining that thing up to a parking meter. It was $65 from the community board. Um, How many years later did you pay those tickets? Or? Oh, no, we paid them. We paid them. In fact, because I was such a good marketer, I studied the traffic patterns. I would, I would learn how many people would be walking by Monday through Sunday. And I would decide, oh, today, you know, it's a busy day on 72nd Street. It's worth the $65 ticket to chain it up because I'm going to get three plus riders. Um, and that's, that's kind of how it started. And today, look, we're at 92 studios. We're opening in London uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we see well over 30,000 people a day. Uh, and I think what's so amazing about SoulCycle is that, you know, it, it's not a fitness business at all. It's really a business about people. It's a business about empowerment. It's a business about community. It's a business about supporting other people and by doing that, finding yourself. Um, it's a business about being human. And I think that, you know, what has led to such incredible success for SoulCycle, and to be perfectly honest with you, what's led to such incredible retention of our riders is, you know, is the human connection that our staff and we have with our riders and also the connections that we've been able to foster between our riders. And I think that's really what is the most powerful thing about what we've created. Beautiful. So before, I want to talk more about that, but I, I want to stay with you for a moment. Um, this audience here, we're, we're all going through this, what I think about as like a revolution in how companies do marketing. And the people in this room um, were leading the way in many ways. And there's a lot of challenges, there's a lot of resistance, a lot of struggle. And just in general, building a career in this world is difficult. How, tell us about um, how you handled struggle, how you hand both struggle at work, struggle with your partner, struggle, emotional struggle of just having to juggle it all, being a mom starting a business, and what were some of the practices and tools and things that you 
you amassed over time to just be able to continue to grow and not, not fall over? Definitely. So, you know, when we started the business, you know, it was, like I said, it was 1,200 square feet and it was 35 bikes. And truthfully, I was the only employee there, so I just had to manage myself. Um, you know, cut to, you know, six or seven years later, we have 2,000 employees. You know, I'm now the CEO of a big company. I certainly don't have the skills to handle that. And on top of it, I have a co-founder and a co-CEO who is, you know, we have a well, the great thing about Elizabeth and I is that we, you know, we really have a very different but complementary skill sets, and we share the same vision, but we're two very different people. Um, and so let's first start by talking about a partnership or the relationships that you have with colleagues. Um, you know, like any great relationship, like a marriage, which is something that I also spend a lot of time working on with my husband, um, you know, you really have to figure out how to have the tools and the communication skills that you need to make, you know, these work and relationships and partnerships work. So early on, Elizabeth and I started to see, um, you know, a business coach or, you know, our, our business therapist, basically, because we were two people that wanted to grow a successful business, but, you know, there were moments where, you know, she felt like she needed to be home more and I was ready to step on the gas and open another 15 studios or, you know, everything from small things about how we wanted to lead to were we ready to sell our company. Yeah. And so we learned really early on how to communicate with each other. And the amazing thing about doing that work was as we worked on those skills for ourselves, we had an incredible chief culture officer who would, you know, after we had sort of figured out the techniques and those skills, she would kind of codify them and we turned them into lessons that we would teach to the entire company. And so we were learning skills and then we were teaching those same skills to all of our employees. And what ultimately wound up happening was we were all on the same page and we were all communicating in the same language. And we also created a really amazing environment where you know, the, the things that we learned were things like getting unstuck, you know, how to tell your colleague you know, what you're tripped up on or, <laughs> you know, the truth is it all really has to do with learning how to listen you know, learning how, to, learning how to listen, right. <laughs> learning how to listen and al also really, you know, learning, creating an environment that is safe enough for people to feel like they can hear, not criticism, but they can hear things, the way that people are feeling about them at work and not say, you know, it's a criticism of me or I feel badly about it or I don't like the way that you're, but that it's all in a space where it's only constructive, right? Where people, you know, if you, if you can all agree that being able to express yourself freely and you can figure out the language to tell somebody not what's wrong with them, but a way that you could be better, I, I think that's a really different thing. And so we worked with a coach. Um, we would you, by the way, would you just yes or no? Would you say the coach changed your life? Changed my life in every way. Just follow, follow that. How did you find the coach? So this is a great story, actually. My business partner, who is very different than me, um, Elizabeth, short, short life history of Elizabeth, um, she went to University of Boulder, she moved back to Telluride, like super crunchy, all of our Soul Cycle studios have crystals behind the bikes, we do a whole saging ritual before we open, the, it's like a whole thing. Um, she is like, you know, the spiritual fairy godmother of Soul Cycle. And you know, at this point, we're only a year into our business relationship, we had a third partner, that didn't work out. Uh, we're still new, we're trying to figure out our relationship with each other, and she's much more sort of, you know, crunchy than I am. So she calls me up one night and she says, I'm having a panic attack, this business is getting too successful too quickly, I don't know if I want it to be that big, I need to stay home and take care of my children, we're gonna go see um, a therapist together. And I'm thinking, I don't even know you, and I have to go to work tomorrow. She says, so I Googled Life Coach NYC, and we're meeting this woman in the lobby of a hotel in the Gramercy Park. I said, you Googled? life coach, NYC, in the middle of the night, and I'm gonna get in a cab and go to Gramercy and talk to somebody about our darkest secrets. Um, here's a good idea. You go see the coach, and I'm gonna go run the business, and I'll see you later on. That's what we all do here, is get on the other side of that Google search. So right. For all of us, we did all these stories yesterday about how searching and Google changes your life. This is a perfect story. Well, let me just tell you something. This is a life changer. In fact, so much of a life changer that our coach is so incredible now. I mean, now you can't Google her because she no longer is available. <laughs> the, by the way, she, yeah. now she actually helps everybody at Google. Um, I mean, you know, um, but it's, it's, she was incredible and she turned out to be 
really transformational for not just us, but for our entire organization. And you know, I think that there are a lot of things. I think just the willingness to, to know that you can be better, to know that you can always be better. Um, I think that's, that's part of it, just bringing that mindset to work every day. And um, for us, you know, really making the time, that's the other thing too, right? You get so busy and you think, we're always busy. I mean, everybody's busy. We never have enough time to do everything. And you think, like, I can't take an hour out of my day to talk to somebody, to stop, to try to be better, to communicate with somebody on my team. But actually, those are the most important hours. And if we don't communicate well, and if we don't take that time to work on ourselves, then what winds up happening is another something that we uh, created, which is we, we used to call it a lot of lumpy carpets. You know, you just keep sweeping the things. You keep sweeping the things. And we actually developed a program called No Lumpy Carpets. I like that lumpy carpet. Um, where you really do, you know, it was sort of a company mandate to take the time to sweep those things out and to, you know, to get things cleaned up. Otherwise, moving on, it just eventually it becomes an explosion. Yeah. So, we, so uh, I talked about this yesterday, this idea that the people around us that are closest to us oftentimes have the secrets to our own growth, to our own progress. Um, if you can create that safe space to get the feedback totally. and you can ask for it, it, it can change your life. Um, any feedback that stands out in your life that you got that, that stuck with you that really evoked some kind of change in Julie? Hmm. Something in particular. Or types of feedback, categories of feedback, things that you felt like maybe you kept like, I know for me, I'll hear something like, hey, Seth, you come out of a meeting and you think something happened, but it didn't happen. And then I'm like, yeah, that's, that's wrong. And then I'll hear that again and again. And I'm like, okay, maybe some things are happening that maybe I'm just delusional. Um, yes. So, uh, no, you know, I, I think that one of the most important things that, um, that, somebody called me on once was, you know, somebody sat me down to tell me that I had no meeting integrity. Um, and I thought that was really interesting because I thought just everybody just understood how busy that I was. I mean, certainly nobody could be offended if I canceled a meeting with them two times and four times and six times and then when it actually did happen, I showed up 30 minutes late while somebody else was sitting outside of my office. And to me, it was just, you know, here I was running this big company and I, you know, I was, you know, trying to design the retail and train the teachers and meet with everybody and run the company and people were getting offended. I mean, people were pissed. Like to me, you know, to me it was just like, oh, I'm so busy. I, I'm dying to see you and when I get around to it, it's going to be awesome. We'll hug and kiss and have the best meeting ever. But, you know, by the sixth time that I didn't show up for somebody, they were taking it personally and it, it felt shitty to them that I canceled so many times. And for me, it was a total blind spot. Honestly, like I, I never meant to offend anybody. I was just busy. Yeah, yeah. So what's fascinating to me about SoulCycle is um, so you're paying, someone's paying you know, 30 50 $80 a month to go to gym, and they can get, they can get these classes for free. You, you got people to not just pay per class, but then they're buying your clothing, right? They're buying your clothing, basically doing marketing for you, and you're selling out of your clothing. Um, you, and you, talking, you talked before about the community that you built, and you basically did marketing on the backs of people. Um, we're, all in, we're all building a brand, contributing towards building a brand. Um, this group here, we're trying to figure out how we can unlock the wisdom of our companies and, and, and bring and inspire our customers as a result. How, how is building a brand different today than it was? And you know, how do you build a brand where the people are paying for t-shirts? Yes. Well, let me start out by saying that, interestingly enough, our retail business at SoulCycle, thank you very much, our retail business at SoulCycle, which actually now is quite a big business. Um, I mean, we, we, we design 14 collections a year. It's, it's quite a big thing. But in the beginning, it was actually marketing. And, and it was intentionally marketing. Um, we started the business for $250,000. Uh, Elizabeth had made an investment in another entrepreneur's company. She had invested $25,000 that turned into $250,000, and that's the way that we started our business. We built the front desk from Ikea. We made four different trips in Elizabeth's station wagon to get all the kitchen cabinetry and to build our front desk. And after we built the studio from Ikea, rolled in our 35 bikes that we rented and figured out how much we needed to save for some run rate, we had $2,000 left over and Elizabeth looked at me and she said, okay, you're the marketing department, so what do you want to do? And at the time we had no influencers and no Instagram, right? And I said, well, I'm going to make t-shirts and I'm going to get the 200 coolest people that I know in New York City. And cool could have meant the, you know, the parents that were the president of the PTA on 77th Street because I understood it that, I, that I needed local influencers. I certainly wasn't looking for the Kardashians to wear my t-shirts, you know. I wanted people 
that could bring other people in the neighborhood. And I said to myself, I'm going to figure out who I'm going to give these 200 t-shirts to, and I'm going to give them those t-shirts with some free passes and tell them that you know I really need their help building my business and their opinion is important to me, and I'm going to listen to their feedback when they come, and I'm going to sort of make them my ambassadors. And that's what I did. And we figured out how to deliver those 200 t-shirts. Um, we had a couple extra, which we hung in the studio, and I did put price tags on them. I think I was able to, with my $2,500 or whatever, print 250, and I only gave away 200, and so the other 50 were for sale there. And what I noticed was that people wore the t-shirts and they loved them, but the other 50 went pretty quick also, and that was because of this. I always say Soul Cycle is like going on the best vacation you've ever been on, or um, you know, doing something that makes you feel so good that you want to take a piece of it home with you. Our retail has nothing to do with, maybe at this point it does, but it has really nothing to do with fashion or the way you look, whatever. It's like you feel like such a badass in that class. You feel like so much more than you thought you were when you walked in the door. We have made you feel like you matter. And everybody wants to matter, right? So taking home a piece of that is like a small reminder to you that you can be something bigger than you thought. And it's it, again, it's you know when you're you know your car for the airport is waiting and you're like crying at the front desk thinking I have to go back to my real life, so I'll buy anything the gift shop wants to tell me. It doesn't matter how much it costs here. And that's kind of what the Soul Cycle shop is like. It's like you just want to take a piece of that like sort of minute of euphoria home with you. And the way that we did it was really by caring. You know, in the beginning, we had, no, we had no sign on the front door. It was me behind the front desk. And if people were willing to find our studio, pay $27 for something that was included in their gym membership, walk to the rear lobby of a building, click into a bike in a dark room for 45 minutes, and take that chance on me, like I was going to love them more than anybody in their life loved them. I watched people's dogs, I fed people's parking meters, I let people's kids sit there, I brought extra iPads. It was like, there was nothing I would not do to make sure that my customers knew that I appreciated them. And then on top of it, I listened to them. Somebody would tell me that they didn't like the way the laundry detergent sm smelled on the towels. You know what I did? I would change it. And sure enough, 15 people would say to me, oh my god, did you change the detergent? I didn't like the way that it smelled. But one person told me, and I listened, and I'd made a change on something. I actually executed on a piece of feedback that somebody would give me. And you know what? People appreciated it. Everybody felt like they mattered. People felt like their voices were being heard. And it ultimately caused people to engage in the community in a different way because they felt like it was a place where they, they were important. And I think that that is really, you know, when I think about marketing today and how much things have changed, you know, look, I, I ultimately, you know, we understood how to read our data. I mean, data did not come until at least five or six years into the business. You know, I was the marketer for a long time and I certainly did not have the expertise in terms of using data in the way that people are using it now. Um, but what I will say is that, you know, I know that everybody is working on global businesses, you know, obviously, you know, digitally figuring it out is the biggest part of what everybody does here. But there is something about talking to your customers, about being in the communities, about figuring out a way to get some face-to-face -face feedback or picking up a telephone or actually understanding a demographic. I would say to everybody at SoulCycle, you know, I could learn more, you know, flying across the country and standing behind a front desk of a studio that I had not visited in 10 minutes than I could, sitting at my desk for 10 weeks, trying to understand the nuance of why the numbers weren't doing well or why people didn't like this or that. And I do think that, you know, that we need to think locally sometimes, that we need to be in our businesses, that we need to be customers of these businesses. I mean, how, how often are we actually trying the experiences that we're trying to market? Because, you know, it's pretty easy. When you try the experiences, you can almost immediately understand the pain points. Um, and I think that those really simple things are, are things that we forget sometimes because we begin to think so high level and how many people can we reach and whatever that I think that we underestimate the feedback that one or two people can yeah. give us. So this, so a lot of the, a lot of us here are, we, we're not operating where we have a physical presence where we get to actually touch the customer, you know, as the core of the business. Um, we're trying to create the same outcome though, in terms of the connection and the feeling that people have interacting with us. Uh, create a lot of content, we create videos, we touch websites. Any thoughts on how 
we get feedback from customers and, then, and it, or ways that we can use in a non-physical way how totally. to create the same outcome. So like here is, you know, here's an example of, you know, once we got to a place where we were able to, you know, look at our data and mine it, you know, we did a, a marketing partnership that I actually think was, was super successful. And I think it speaks to people feeling heard and understood in the same way that a physical presence does. So we, um, we had a partnership with Spotify where we were doing pop-up events with them, where we were creating, you know, Spotify pop shops and little mini studios at South by Southwest and a bunch of different other things. And for our 10-year anniversary, what we decided to do was we, you know, we mined our data and we created an app, which was called My Soul Journey. And every single person in our database got a personalized, um, you know, we, was made from an algorithm, they got a personalized page on the app where it told them four or five data points. It told them like what their first ride was at SoulCycle. It was their soul anniversary. It told them how many times how many times they had actually taken SoulCycle classes. People love to feel like, whoa, I took 500 classes. I'm such a rock star, you know? And then what was really interesting was it told them who the instructors that they liked to ride with the most were and how many times they had taken those classes. And then what it did was, because we have on our, the part of the way that we market on our website is we tell you, you know, what types of music each of these instructors you know, plays, they got a personalized playlist made for them which was you know, a mix of, of the things that would have come from the types of classes that they like to take. And so it was a really great way to kind of mine the data and yet make people feel like, wow, how did you know me like that? You know, How do you know and appreciate the first time I've been here? How do you know what kind of shape I've been in because I've been here so many times? And most of all, how did you make me a playlist that I'm listening? And so those are the kinds of things, like when you think about you know, ways that you can reach people that they feel like they are heard or that they're seen in a business that doesn't even have a physical presence, like how, how do you mine the data for things like that? Very cool. All right, let's change the topic. So, you went from you're 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 always an entrepreneur. You you're now, you found your way into in many two places to bigger companies. Right? You're part of the part of Equinox, and then subsequently you've been at WeWork, um, which is uh, you know went from I don't know how many employees when you started like five thousand maybe at, at WeWork when you started. Yeah, probably that's five or six thousand. Now today's twelve thousand. Yeah. Any, um, any tips on, many of us are here at companies over 500, over 1,000 employees, even, even over 10,000. Any tips on getting things done at a big company, what to do, what not to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. We, we were joking about this in the back because we think we're learning. <laughs> you're laughing. learning. I mean, look, when you're, you know, when you're used to, you know, starting as a scrappy entrepreneur, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's wild not to have to do everything. Although when I left SoulCycle, we were already at 2,500 employees, so I was, I was leading a large organization. But look, I think that you have to, um, you know, you have to be decisive, but still be collaborative. I think that you have to have a point of view, but I think you have to also be willing to listen to other people's point of view. Uh, I think there's a really fine line between you know, defending things that you genuinely believe will make a difference for the business and also still being able to hear the people around you and, and you know, take the, have, to have the mental space to think about it. Look, I think also for people that are in leadership positions, it is creating your orgs in a way that gives people a clear delineation of what they do and don't have authority over, making sure that people know what lane they can run in so that they feel like they have some autonomy. You know, everybody wants to feel like they have the ability to make a decision no matter how small or how big it is and being very clear about who gets to make what decisions so that people have realistic expectations so that they know when they are a leader and when they are a collaborator. Um, so I think that you know it's you really have to develop. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of muscles to develop when you work in a company yeah. that's big. I think that you have to really be an entrepreneur, and then you also have to be able not to be reactive, not not letting not taking things personally. Yes, not being reactive and not taking things yeah, personally. Absolutely. Sometimes um, I'm okay at that, and sometimes I'm it's terrible. A, it's, a, it's a process. Yeah. Uh, last question, and then I think we can maybe do two two or three from the audience. Um, when I think of leadership and leaders, and I think about conductor, you know, there's people who have big teams, or you know, that's being, you know, that's classified as being a manager, and then there are people who are leaders, people who um, are seen and are leaders in the company, and some of them have big teams, and some of them have no teams, right? 
we need to be leaders to, to be successful, um, whether we have teams or whether we don't. How, how do you define what is a leader to you? What does it mean to be a leader? What do you learn about being a leader? You know, I think that, first of all, I think that being a leader is first and most importantly like walking the walk. You know, I think there are a lot of mission statements that we paint on the wall these days and everybody's using the word authentic and community and, you know, I think that, you know, all of these things have become zeitgeist, right? I mean, words that we used to treasure as being precious have become zeitgeist. Everybody's mission driven, Every, you know. So to me, it's like, you know, everybody can talk the talk, right? I mean, that's, that, that's what everybody's out there doing. It's like, how do we walk the walk? Who are you when nobody is looking at you? To me, that is really being a leader. And then I think the other thing about being a leader is, well, I'll tell you there's three things. I think that being a leader is really walking the walk. I think that being a leader means that you are willing to do every and any job to understand your business, to better serve your customer, but also to better understand the struggles that your employees are going through and to keep really in touch with what is going on in the day-to-day -day, you know, going-ons of your businesses. I think that we, as we become leaders and as we elevate, we, we lose touch with what it is that really is making our employees and our businesses run. And I think it's very important to make sure that you never do lose touch with that. And then I think the last thing is really humility. It's being able to say, you know, I was wrong. I read a great article this morning in um, Business of Fashion, and it was Gucci talking about the mistakes that they'd recently made with garments that they released. And their CEO, who I think is an incredible example of you know, a culture builder, said you know, he did not go on a hunt in the organization to figure out who designed this garment and who put it into the world. He said, it was my mistake. The buck stops here. I run this company. And however it got out there, that's my problem because that's who I am. And I think, you know what? We all need to understand that people make mistakes. We make mistakes. And it is really the way that you deal with those mistakes, the way that you step up and owning. take, yeah, owning, owning it. it. Yeah. We have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, we got a very eager hand right here. Can you just stand up and project loudly your question? Um, Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca. Let me repeat the question, just for people in the other room. So, um, you have a sexy brand, her brand, not so sexy. What is your advice for the companies here that don't have a sexy brand like yours? Well, first of all, I just want to say that when I started SoulCycle, there was nothing sexy about it. And I just want you to know that my, hu my husband used to say to me when we would go out to dinner with friends, please don't talk about your business. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> um, so I just want you to know that it wasn't, it was, it wasn't sexy before Jay-Z started coming, you know. Um, but I will say that, you know, I mean, it was sweaty bikes in a dark room that was, you know, and what made it sexy was the way that we treated the people that were using our product. So I think like when you think about making something sexy, I mean, you know, do, or how are you delivering? You know, when people are interacting with your product, I always say like, I never wanted users, I wanted evangelists. I mean, when people are done engaging with your product, are they going out into the world saying to other people, like, you will never believe what kind of a seamless experience I just had. It was so easy for me to use this. I, you know, to me, that is how it becomes sexy. It becomes sexy because people are so happy with what kind of, what they have just received that they're now in the world telling their friends about it. And I, I think that's the way that you can make anything sexy is by just killing it on the delivery and the experience of what people are, want. And I would say, because I know we have lots of companies here that are technology, that are only working with, you know, maybe very specific kind of engineering. It's like whatever's sexy to those people, right? If there's a certain way running continuous deployment that's really popular is, and that's really, like, it's, it's listening and it's, it's harnessing the love that those people have for whatever it is that you do and projecting that back to them and totally. being a company that is the safe community where doing whatever is sexy in that category is, is evangelized and loved and embraced and welcome and safe. 
And I think that can, you know, we, we see that can exist in any business. Um, I mean, to me, some of the sexiest things like online is like the way that somebody will return a purchase that I made. Like, it's sexy if they let me know that, like, they've received my return request, they have received my package, and now they are refunding my credit card. If I get all three of those emails, like, in a very short amount of time, and I don't have to stress out if, like, the $2,000 was returned to my credit card or not, like, that's sexy for me. Amazing. I like that. I, I gave Julie a list of questions about a week ago, and then I changed them all about 30, sec 30, 30 minutes before we started. You are incredible. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, guys.